Hello, you're watching Eye on Africa. I'm James Creedon. These are our headlines from across the continent this evening. A new round of violence in Darfur has killed more than 60 people, according to the UN. Sudan's prime minister says troops will be sent into the conflict-stricken region. We'll hear more from our correspondent in Khartoum. He was riddled with bullets before seeking exile in Belgium, but a political giant in Tanzania has now returned home. Tondu Lissou wants to run for president. We'll bring you a report on how he plans to upset Tanzania's political scene. In DR Congo, the currency has lost 15% of its value in the past three months. The knock-on effect on ordinary Congolese is often severe. We'll get more from our team in Congo. Thanks for watching. Uh, Eye on Africa. Now, another round of killings in Sudan's West Darfur has left at least 60 people dead. According to the United Nations, armed men attacked a village in the provincial capital on Saturday. Darfur has been devastated since 2003 by a conflict between ethnic minority rebels and forces loyal to now ousted President Omar al-Bashir. Delano D'Souza reports on this latest massacre. A string of violent attacks in Sudan's Darfur region. According to the United Nations, unidentified gunmen killed 20 people on Friday and more than 60 others on Saturday. According to witnesses, houses were burned and shops looted. The UN's Office for the Coordination of Humanitarian Affairs says the escalation of violence in Darfur has led to increased displacement, compromising the agricultural season, and has resulted in the loss of lives and livelihoods. Sudan's Prime Minister has pledged to send troops to the region after protesters demanded protection. The latest uptick in violence is threatening the country's fragile transition to democracy. Last year, Sudan's longtime dictator Omar al-Bashir was overthrown by the military after a popular uprising. A power-sharing government composed of military and civilian leaders was sworn in last September. Nearly 2.8 million people are estimated to be food insecure in Darfur. 20% of them live in the western part of the province where the recent attacks took place. Now, as we heard there, Omar al-Bashir was ousted last year and there are ongoing efforts to transition to the post-Bashir to a post-Bashir era of democracy. Earlier, I spoke to Naba Mohyeddin, who has been following uh, the story for us. I asked her how the situation in Darfur might impact on Sudan's fragile peace. Actually, what's happening in Darfur and what's happening in Darfur is um, impacting Sudan, because Sudan is trying to, 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 to be stable and to be lifted from U.S. Uh, list of terrorism, sponsorship of terrorism, and uh, trying to make peace talks with rebel groups. So whatever happens in Darfur, it will impact the peace talks uh, process in, in Sudan and in Khartoum and the new government. And it represents a new challenge for, for transition and for democracy. The other thing is, uh, is this cycle of violence after al-Bashir al-Assad is um, happening again. People will lose their faith and belief in the revolution and the change. So I think it will make things worse than before uh, during al-Bashir time. So, yes, I think the top priority for now is to stop the war in Darfur, to make uh, the peace talks um, successful, and to make uh, the issues like land ownership um, clear for people because it's like a bump. Uh, it's, uh, it's like a bump, and all the time the conflict is renewable. Now, efforts to resolve the ongoing political crisis in Mali were taken up a notch on Monday with threats of sanctions for those who don't back a unity government. The heads of the 15-nation regional bloc, ECOWAS, held a video conference. and They have been overseeing several attempts in recent weeks to urge the 5M opposition to work with President Ibrahim Boubacar Keita. Now, he has refused opposition demands for him to resign. Now, on Monday evening, his office announced the formation of a limited cabinet that will work on the formation of a unity government. Now, that would indicate Keita's willingness to accept the path forward proposed by uh, ECOWAS. Now, one factor that could help resolve the crisis, West African leaders have said 31 Malian MPs must resign without delay. Their parliamentary seats had been contested by the opposition after accusations of fraud in recent parliamentary elections. The Supreme Court had come down in favour of President Keita's party. That was a major factor in sparking uh, recent anti-government protests. Let's take a listen to Niger's president reacting to today's uh, video conference. Mamadou Yusufu is the acting head of ECOWAS. We demanded the immediate resignation of 31 MPs whose election is contested, including the president of parliament. 
The presidential majority must do all it can to obtain these resignations. This would lead to parliamentary by-elections, a swift plan for a unity government with the opposition and civil society, and especially the M5, which is encouraged to participate in this unity government. Morocco is banning all travel to and from some of its major cities uh, to try to stem a small spike in coronavirus cases. The ban includes the cities of Tangier, Casablanca and Marrakech. Morocco still remains less impacted than its European neighbours uh, to the north, despite this recent surge. To Tanzania next, uh, where an opposition heavyweight, Tundu Lisu, has returned from exile. He had been shot 16 times in a 2017 attack that preceded his exile. And now he says he plans to run for president in elections later this year. How will this upset the Tanzanian political scene? Laurent Berstecker has the story. A hero's welcome for Tanzania's exiled opposition leader. Tundulisu was greeted by friends, family and political allies as he set foot on home soil for the first time in three years. He was cheered on by crowds of supporters eager to see him challenge President John Magufuli in the upcoming October elections. He's one of the strongest um, opposition members, so yeah, I'm very happy that he's here and he's going to run for presidency. The vice chairman of Chadema, Tanzania's main opposition movement, Tundulisu has long been a fierce critic of John Magufuli's government, which he repeatedly accused of authoritarian practices. In 2017, he was shot 16 times by unknown gunmen and subsequently fled to Belgium, where he spent the next three years seeking treatment for his injuries. After almost fully recovering from the attack, for which nobody was ever arrested, Lisu recently announced his intention to return and to run for the country's highest office. I have what it takes to get rid of President Magufuli. Uh, I have the determination, I have the knowledge, I have the experience. Since his election in November 2015, John Magufuli has earned praise for pushing through a series of anti-corruption reforms. But he's faced growing criticism for his government's alleged crackdown on freedom of speech, and more recently, for its handling of the coronavirus crisis. In Ivory Coast, Henri Conan Bédier has been officially designated to run as a presidential candidate for the opposition PDCI party. So far, the octogenarian ex-president is the highest profile uh, candidate to officially declare his intention to run. With the October vote now less than four months away, things are beginning uh, to heat up. Sam Bradpiece has more. At 86 years old, Henri Conan Bédier is having another crack at the Ivorian presidency. Having been officially named as the candidate for the PDCI party on Monday, he will now be one of the main opposition candidates in October's election. Bédier served as president of the Ivory Coast from 1993 to 1999 before being ousted in a coup. He then ran again unsuccessfully for the top job in 2000 and 2010. Now, some critics are saying he's simply too old to be running for president again, a claim that he denied to France 24. Bédier's nomination comes as no real surprise. He was his party's only candidate standing in the national primary. He now looks likely to face off against incumbent President Alassane Ouattara, who may stand for a controversial and to some unconstitutional third term in office. The country's other main party, the FPI, have yet to officially name a candidate for the presidential elections, although its main figurehead, Laurent Bagbo, who is currently facing an appeal at the International Criminal Court, having been acquitted of crimes against humanity, looks unlikely to be granted access to the country anytime soon. Next to DR Congo, where the economy is in rocky territory after the knock-on effect of COVID-19 restrictions, the Congolese franc has lost 15% of its value in three months, reaching an all-time low. Now, this has reduced uh, the purchasing power for ordinary Congolese people. When 80% of the population lives on less than $2 a day, 
the results can be devastating. Our team in Kinshasa reports. Money changers in Kinshasa are struggling to make sense of what's happened. Just three months ago, the Congolese franc was trading at 1,700 to the US dollar. Now the greenback is worth more than 2,000 francs. There are really a lot of demand on the dollar American. That's why you see that every day there is always an increase in the taux. People don't want to keep the francs Congolais at home. The US dollar is widely perceived as a safe haven currency in DR Congo, especially in times of crisis. It's used alongside the local currency, and many goods and services are paid for in dollars. This public sector worker, for example, receives his salary in Congolese francs, but pays his rent in dollars. He says he's lost more than half of his purchasing power over the past few years. My salary was 1,000 Donc, il y a une perte énorme. Et quand je paye les loyers, pratiquement tout est fini. The COVID-19 crisis has wreaked havoc on global markets, exacerbating currency volatility. This economist, however, says the pandemic has only worsened an already worrying situation. He blames this on the rapid increase in public spending since President Felix Tshisekedi came to power a year ago, and in particular the launch of costly infrastructure projects. Ces investissements publics, malheureusement, au lieu d'utiliser le matériel ici, on a importé. On est arrivé au mois de, à la fin de l'année 2019, le, le déficit, le déficit de balance commerciale a explosé. DR Congo has long grappled with chronic economic instability. The country exports very little and imports almost everything, which increases the demand for dollars. Forecasters predict the exchange rate will reach 2,600 Congolese francs to the dollar by the end of the year. All right, that's all for this edition of Ion Africa. Thanks for watching and good night.